Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. For decades, policymakers and thought leaders feared a population bomb. That is, the world population would expand so much and so rapidly that resources like food and water would be in short supply. We would breed ourselves towards extinction. Recently, however, the opposite issue has caused concern, that we're not producing enough babies. If a disproportionate percentage of the population is old, who's going to pay to support the elderly and infirm? Who's going to fill jobs vacated by recent retirees? So as fertility rates across the world decline, are we in trouble? Or are fewer kids a sign of progress? In order to keep the population level steady, Every woman has to have 2.1 kids, on average, of course. I guess demographers don't like rounding down. Now, that steady rate is called replacement level fertility. It's when the number of deaths is fully offset by the number of births. Fertility rate isn't a biological term, by the way, but a reference to how many babies are being born to women in their prime childbearing years. Overall, the global fertility rate exceeds the replacement rate. That's why the UN expects global population to soar from 7.6 billion today to 11.2 billion by the year 2100. The issue is just about half the world's population lives in countries where the fertility rate is below the replacement rate of 2.1. It's mostly a problem in advanced economies. In the US, for instance, the fertility rate is currently 1.76. It's 1.4 in both Italy and in Japan. In South Korea, it's 1.2. The country has closed over 3,500 schools since the 1980s because there are fewer and fewer children. Philip Morgan, a sociologist at UNC Chapel Hill, told me low fertility rates create strange age structures in a society. That is, there are a lot more older people than younger people. This is a problem because getting old is expensive. Nursing homes, healthcare, etc. So the elderly frequently depend on subsidized healthcare or public pensions like Medicare and Social Security here in the States. These taxpayer funded safety nets depend on younger workers paying into them. So when the birth rate goes down, eventually there'll be fewer people contributing and the math gets screwed up. The whole system becomes unsustainable. That's not good. A low fertility rate might also negatively impact a country's productivity. When folks retire, there's no one to replace them, so GDP can suffer. Many countries are very concerned about this, so they've taken measures, often pretty colorful, to try and increase the birth rate. South Korea has spent some $70 billion on various fertility campaigns over the course of a decade. In Italy and Singapore, there are these controversial ad campaigns that either depict childless life as reckless and irresponsible, or depict motherhood as the highest attainable goal for a woman. Russia created a day of conception. Citizens were given the day off so that they could procreate. If things worked out and they had a kid exactly nine months later, they were eligible for prizes like a new car or a refrigerator. Poland, meanwhile, produced a video encouraging its citizens to breed like rabbits. Więc jeśli chcesz kiedyś zostać rodzicem, weź przykład z królików. Wiem co mówię. Ojciec miał nas 60 troje. Denmark has launched a racy Do It For Denmark campaign that encourages patriots to conceive on vacation. Faktisk har danskerne 46% mere sex på ferie sammenlignet med hverdagen. Not to be outdone, Singapore has national night. I'll let this amazing video speak for itself. I've been happy all night like an easy link card. Let's make a little human that looks like you and me. Exploring your body like the night safari. Wacky videos aside, the effort to raise the fertility rate isn't just about splashy marketing. A variety of countries have implemented policy solutions addressing one of the main reasons for the decline in the fertility rate, something Sarah Browner Otto, a social demographer at McGill University, described to me as work-family conflict. That is, as women have gained increased access to the labor market, they have discovered that a child is often a detriment to a career. Consider the cruel overlap of prime childbearing years, from a biological standpoint at least, and the time in one's life when you start gaining traction at your job. So, Browner Otto told me, women are sort of forced to make a choice between growing a family or pursuing professional goals. A lot of women are prioritizing their career, hence the declining fertility rate. 
For example, it's not a surprise that South Korea isn't producing as many babies as before when you realize the country ranks last in the amount of time men spend on childcare. Plus, South Korea has one of the worst gender wage gaps in the developed world. With these obstacles, women are understandably reluctant to have kids. So, a lot of countries are realizing that if you want to increase the fertility rate, they have to make the workplace more hospitable to moms. Hence, France and Sweden have subsidized childcare. Several countries have increased paternal leave and encouraged flexible work conditions for new mothers. Singapore just gives money to new parents. But these measures, while laudable, have not eliminated gender wage disparity in the workplace. A recent study shows that when women have their first baby between 25 and 35, their pay trajectory never fully recovers. No wonder, then, that many women are waiting later in life to have children. In the US, nearly one in five births are now by women 35 or older. So perhaps the recent decline in the fertility rate merely reflects the postponement of pregnancies. And if you take a long view, things will balance out over time. However, Donna Strabino, a professor of population, family, and reproductive health at Johns Hopkins, warned me that women who wait longer in life to get pregnant are more likely to experience complications and fertility issues. They may plan on having kids, but they eventually find themselves unable to. Morgan, on the other hand, told me we shouldn't overthink fears about the biological window closing on unsuspecting women. The bigger downward threat to the fertility rate, in his opinion, is that women will transition from postponing pregnancy to deciding, hey, life is pretty good without a kid. I'm gonna skip this whole baby thing altogether. We're just waiting for the right time. It's not something you wanna rush into. There's no way we could have a child now. Mm -mm. Not with the market the way it is, no. Now, for those of us who don't like the government to interfere with our private lives, that's a completely respectable decision, and it underscores an important point. The decision to have a child is deeply personal. Ronald Lee, a demographer at Cal Berkeley, told me that governments may worry about funding the social safety net and replacing workers, but on the individual level, few of us stay up at night worrying about the solvency of public pensions. We fret about our own households, and not having kids is one way to stay out of financial trouble. I mean, kids are really expensive. Plus, having babies isn't the only way to fix Social Security. Lee points out that governments can simply raise the age when citizens receive benefits like Social Security. He told me there's no reason to ask young people to fund leisurely retirements. Since folks are living longer than before, it makes sense to ask them to work a little longer too. In terms of decrease in productivity, if there are too few workers, Morgan told me advances in technology can make up for that. Automation will replace many retiring baby boomers, for example. Now, every expert I spoke to pointed out that the fertility rate is tied to the economy. The rates tend to go down during recessions. When the economy is struggling, it's difficult to afford a kid. But when things improve, you generally see an uptick in births. Yet. As the U.S. emerged from the latest financial recession, as unemployment has shrunk, there has not been a corresponding rise in the fertility rate. Browner Otto told me that's a reflection of the insecurities young people face. Lee told me it's a sign that the fruits of economic growth have not been shared evenly. Wages have barely budged. So regardless of the rest of the positive data, people still feel like we're in a recession, and that recession mindset is keeping births down. In fact, when the New York Times asked young Americans why they're having fewer children than their ideal number, six of the top eight answers had to do with money. The other big issue, sort of the 500 pound sloth in the room, is how the fertility rate impacts climate change, a very real threat to the planet. A recent study found that the best thing you could do for the environment is to simply have one less kid. The study finds that a US family who chooses to have one fewer child would provide the same level of emissions reductions as 684 teenagers who choose to adopt comprehensive recycling for the rest of their lives. Framed this way, not having a child is a generous, even noble act that would make the world a little more sustainable. The Center for Biological Diversity underscores this point by distributing condoms with sayings like, wrap with care, save the polar bear, and before it gets any hotter, remember the sea otter. So basically, this is a multifaceted issue, something that seeks a balance between welfare programs and environmental issues and gender equality and personal choice. And I haven't even touched on immigration, which could potentially be a short-term fix for countries with low fertility rates if it weren't such a politically and culturally fraught issue. 
nor have I touched much on cultural pressure. For instance, when my mother watches this episode, I'm pretty sure she'll text me, when am I getting a grandkid? Okay, I'm gonna go live my life.